the Advanced Tech Podcast, providing a spotlight for innovators and disruptors. For links and show notes, and to find out how to sponsor the Advanced Tech Podcast, go to advancedtechmedia.org. You can also find and sponsor us on Patreon. If you're listening to us on iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify, please take a moment to subscribe and give us a rating. You can also sponsor us using Bitcoin at advancedtechmedia.org slash sponsor. Welcome to the Advanced Tech Podcast. Joining me today is Chris Tremount from Scarcity, uh, CEO of Scarcity. Welcome, Chris. Hey, Alexandra. Good to be with you. So let's dig right in. What uh, prompted you, I guess, before we get into you, let's uh, talk a little bit about your background. Sure. So uh, I started off as an industrial engineer, and I was basically working with big retail corporations, helping them move items from point A to point B for cheaper, uh, you know, faster, safer. Um, so, you know, worked with a bunch of the big Fortune 50, Fortune 500 companies. Did that for a few years. Great early experience, but got out, got burned out pretty quickly. Um, and somewhere along the way there, I caught the entrepreneurship bug, especially uh, related to tech startups. And I've been plugging away at different tech startups, whether it's on my own or working for well-funded startups or working for corporations trying to foster uh, an entrepreneurial type environment uh, for about 10 years now. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about Scarcity, uh, how it got started and kind of what you're hoping to do with it. Yeah, so Scarce City is a Bitcoin-based marketplace that sells Bitcoin goods for Bitcoin using Bitcoin technology. We came up with the idea just, um, you know, observing the creative space in Bitcoin. After spending a few years in the Bitcoin rabbit hole, uh, it was really the creative space that, that drew me in. Uh, taking Bitcoin to its logical conclusion, I felt that the art related to this movement would age to become timeless and uh, iconic of, of the early stages of, of what I think is uh, a real renaissance that we're experiencing here. Uh, so after kind of realizing that and also noticing that a lot of my favorite creatives in the space struggled to uh, sell their goods in a way that was authentic to Bitcoin, uh, I started looking for an opportunity to help that. Uh, you know, one of the best ways for uh, anyone to monetize their art in the crypto space generally is through Ethereum based marketplaces. And they certainly have some cool things going for them, but uh, selling Bitcoin related art uh, by like real Bitcoiners doesn't feel right in that type of format. So I wanted to figure out what we could do uh, using Bitcoin, selling for Bitcoin uh, in a way that uh, is consistent with what I saw as you know, Bitcoin's values. Um, so, you know, we tested a few ideas at first. Uh, the first kind of MVP was selling some face masks that, that used Bitcoin's key pair technology uh, to prove the authenticity and supply of each of the face masks. So kind of, a, you know, cool gimmick, uh, testing out some of the you know, things that make Bitcoin unique. We partnered with an up and coming uh, Bitcoin time traveler to uh, to brand the face mask with his uh, his personal style, and we sold some face masks. Uh, it was went beyond our expectations, uh, and you know some interesting things came out of it. First of all, we got the attention of some of the bigger names in the Bitcoin creative community, specifically Chief Monkey, who's gone on to become our MVP Bitcoin artist. And uh, we learned something about Lightning. It was interesting going into that sale, we weren't sure if we were going to support Lightning. Uh, it just so happened that this was around the timing of the halving and fees were spiking. And it was kind of a last minute call. We were like, okay, well, we have to support Lightning at this point. And we were shocked to see that about a third of our sales were through the Lightning network. And that kind of gave us you know, a little bit of a wake up call, like we have to understand lightning. So that was the first time I set up a lightning wallet. And it was the first transaction using lightning. It, you know, it was tough to set up. I won't say it was, you know, it certainly wasn't re ready for normal users at that point. Uh, but the feeling of having that first transaction go through instantly uh, gave me the feeling of like, okay, this is the future of Bitcoin payments and, and maybe even beyond. 
Uh, and you know, we went down our own lightning rabbit hole at that point and realized that lightning was actually much more than uh, just payments, uh, that uh, it enabled an entire infrastructure for app development. Uh, specifically, Ryan Gentry uh, put out a piece when he was at Multicoin, um, and I always forget the name of this piece because it is kind of hard to remember, but it's like uh, lightning as a web three uh, tool for the heretical uh, developer or some sort. I'm totally butchering it. Uh, but it was a fantastic piece. It totally laid out how lightning uh, public notes could be used as uh, self-sovereign digital ident uh, identification and also laid out how uh, how light, the Lightning Network could be used as infrastructure uh, for a more private form of the internet. Uh, and that kind of started getting our wheels turning. We started talking with our artist community that Chief Monkey had helped us uh, form and started learning about what their needs were and how we could address them with Lightning. And it was actually Chief Monkey who came up with the idea for uh, Lightning Auctions initially. And that's been our first kind of you know, product that we've put our full force and effort behind. Mm -hmm. And that's what our current focus is today. Awesome. I'd love to dig into the Lightning Network a little bit more, but first let's talk about the first Lightning Auction and kind of what's upcoming for the next uh, next few months. Sure. So we did our first auction just over a month ago now. Mm -hmm. And Chief Monkey came up with the idea. So he had to be the guinea pig with this thing. And he created an absolutely beautiful piece called Relentless Optimism. It's uh, the kind of uh, iconic uh, memed Bitcoin Phoenix uh, taking off with a physical Bitcoin in its grasp. Uh, and it's, uh, he partnered uh, with Mosaic Rocks, who uh, does fantastic mosaic work. So it's just it has incredible detail with the mosaic within the Phoenix. Uh, so super proud to be able to debut the auctions with such an amazing piece. And uh, the auction went really well. Um, and maybe I should first start talking, I should start by talking about how lightning auctions work. Essentially, it keeps uh, participants accountable for their bids by uh, collateralizing their bids through the kind of instant low fee anonymous uh, payments on the lightning network. So the way it works is if you want to want to bid on an item, uh, you put in how much you want to bid. We ask for an email address just so we can verify the winner. It doesn't have to be your personal email address. We ask for a dis display name, which acts as your kind of pseudonymous uh, identif identification. And uh, we then prompt you to pay a lightning invoice that represents a small percentage of what you're actually bidding. And this deposit acts as collater collateral for your bid. So at the end of the auction, the highest bidder has 24 hours to pay the full bid amount. If they do not pay that bid amount, they lose their collateral and the next highest bidder has their opportunity to pay their highest bid. And once the final bid has been paid, uh, the remaining participants receive their collateral back. And uh, you know, we battle test this thing with our artist community the best we could before we released it, but you never know how this is gonna go until you put it out there. And uh, we were blown away, blown away by the res res results. There was a ton of enthusiasm. We had 19 different bidders, 53 unique bids, and the winning bid was one Bitcoin, uh, which was beyond our expectations and uh, beyond the expectations of our artists. So we were thrilled with the results, and now we are focused heads down on making it even better, and we have a whole lineup of auctions ready to come. Awesome. Yeah, one Bitcoin is uh, significantly more than it was. Uh, I, I guess when this auction first started, it was December that uh, it was, was it December or January? That's, yeah, it was, it was December. I think it was early December, maybe even late November. Uh, but yeah, the price was around 19K at that point. Mm -hmm. And it was shortly after that the, the Phoenix officially took flight. And here we are sitting twice that much. So even greater result for the artist. That's awesome. That's really nice symbolism too. It, it's totally perfect for the timing of this moment. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So what can people look forward to for upcoming, uh, upcoming auctions? Well, we have our next auction next week. I'm not sure when you'll air this, but it would be the, the second week of January. Mm -hmm. And we have a lineup 
you know, that's, that's pretty healthy for the first quarter of the year of, of additional auctions. And we're improving the, the product uh, each step of the way. A couple of the big upgrades that uh, you can look forward to is we are adjusting the collateral requirement Mm -hmm. uh, which does require a bigger kind of upfront collateral. But if you want to make additional bids, uh, you just have to top off your collateral instead of having to pay kind of a fresh round. Mm -hmm. uh, so we feel like that simultaneously keeps bidders more accountable while reducing friction to really engage with the auction. Uh, we are um, adjusting the increments uh, with which you can bid. Uh, we're just a, a bunch of kind of like, you know, small user interface type of things that'll just make things a little bit uh, slicker. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we have, I think one of our biggest um, upgrades that we haven't started on yet, but we're really excited for is using uh, lightning logins. So being able to log in with your, either your Jewel uh, lightning wallet or using LN URL auth. And the way this works, it's really slick. Uh, essentially, you just scan a QR code with your Lightning wallet and you're signed in. You have all of the benefits of having a traditional account. We're able to maintain your history, maintain you know, whatever information we have that you've given us uh, while maintaining your privacy. We don't need your email address at that point. We don't need a password, uh, nothing like that. And once we have that, we'll also be able to implement a reputation system. So, you know, if you uh, showed you were trustworthy in past auctions, maybe your collateral requirement goes down, mm -hmm. you'll have the option to, um, to authenticate through Twitter. And if you have an established Twitter account, uh, then your Twitter reputation can be on the line rather than collateral payments. Uh, so just overall, we think it offers uh, a better experience for for users and hopefully will lead to more participation and, and higher bids uh, for the artists. Very cool. So I'm curious to see how that uh, I guess um, you probably don't want to announce the inner workings until it's until it's launched but what was the reasoning around using Twitter reputation uh, as a basis for um, for collateral instead of actual funds? Yeah I think um, you know high level studying different auction systems. The main challenge is keeping bidders accountable for their bids. And the two main ways to do that is either through collateral or reputation systems. Uh, now, the trade-off with reputation systems is they usually come with giving up personally identifiable information, mm -hmm. which doesn't really jibe with Bitcoin's principles. Uh, that's why we started with collateral and the Lightning Network makes that so easy. However, uh, it, is, you know, it is somewhat of um, a lift for the user to make sure they have you know, a high balance in their Lightning wallet to put their sats up as collateral. So for the users who are, are open to it, uh, we want to create an option for them to to basically stake their, uh, their reputation instead of the coll their collateral. Uh, and we would do it in a way that doesn't leak any information to Twitter. It wouldn't be your traditional Twitter authentication. It would be through a DM uh, type of system. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it, it, imagine being able to participate in an auction without giving up any collateral. And it's your, it's your uh, Twitter handle that's showing up as a participant in the auction. Not only does that create more of a, a seamless experience, but it also makes the auction more social. We noticed uh, in the first auction that a lot of users who were prolific on Twitter were putting in their Twitter handles as their display name anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's obviously you know, a behavior that's already kind of organic. So if we can promote that uh, while making the auction experience better as far as like not having to give up your sats for even the short term uh, time period of the auction, it's, it's a better experience all around. Cool. And I imagine uh, that would also have deeper privacy uh, trade-offs as well too. So the, the fact that, what I'm thinking of is if people are using like anonymous Twitter accounts, um, just need, needing their username, would that keep everything private or do you need more information beyond that? 
No, that's all we need. You know, of course it depends on the Twitter account. If you just create a Twitter account in the moment and have zero followers like that, you're not giving much reputation for us to work with there. But if you have been on Twitter for 10 years and you have even a few hundred followers, your reputation is on the line. If you don't pay that final bit amount, we're going to call you out and uh, <laughs> it's not going to look good for you. You know, and I, I think especially Bitcoin uh, community centers around Twitter and your Twitter profile is, uh, is it's important to people, right? Uh, reputation goes a long way in this space. So in a lot of ways, it's more valuable uh, than putting up short, short-term short collateral. And again, creates a better user experience. Totally. Yeah, it's funny. Um, my friend Caro uh, wrote something in one of the earlier versions of Citadel or early, earlier editions of Citadel 21 on reputation and how it's the primary Bitcoiners uh, concern. Bitcoiners primary currency. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it's a, it's a really unique thing because you, you hear um, in other communities, you know, people talk about integrity and, re- and reputation. And uh, it seems like the more that that's brought up, usually it, it's, it's correlated to having less. Um, there's a, an example we've seen. I don't want to go too deep into it because I don't want to call out people, but uh, there was a bet that was recently done. And uh, I think uh, the person that lost reneged on it and he wasn't a mm. Bitcoiner. Um, mm. So you can you can read between the lines and find out who that was, but um, but yeah, I think the idea of reputation as currency is very interesting. Um, we've we've kind of lost that, I think, and I think that that's a it's an intrinsic value and an absolute value at the same time. So it's an interesting concept to explore. Yeah, I agree, and I'm fascinated in general by the concept of the pseudonymous economy. This is something Balaji's uh, written a lot about. And it's something that we feel like we're in position to embrace, right? Like you should be able to use your reputation as um, identification uh, and be able to make money with that identification without tethering it directly with who you are in the real world. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, we think there's a lot of opportunity for that for both, both for bidders of our auctions as well as the artists. You know, the auction, a lot of the artists are pseudonymous as well. There's no reason for us to know their real identity, uh, nor for the participants in the auction. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. It's it seems like to me on the surface, it seems like you're exploring um, and exploring a market that has uh, privacy as its as its first um, first point, um, without going directly into a dark market where it's fully anonymous. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but uh, it seems like you've got like a public facing, privacy first marketplace developing, which will be really interesting to watch. We think it's really important for this space. You know, users value their privacy as they should. And we want to respect that as much as we can. It's, um, you know, it's part of Bitcoin and we want to align our platform with Bitcoin as much as possible. Cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the social side of Bitcoin. And, you know, there's been a long discussion, you know, there is a Bitcoin community, there isn't a Bitcoin community, but I think that you can kind of look at it that, um, you know, like you were saying, this cultural renaissance and, you know, this art renaissance within, within the space, it's really such a, a, a rich ground for creativity. Um, it's really interesting to see what's happened in the last couple of years, especially, uh, especially 2020. Uh, I think when we had all the additional time, <laughs> I think that maybe gave people to uh, time to explore that side and maybe spend a little bit more time uh, working on those nebulous creativity, uh, nebulous creative ideas that we never seem to have time for. So, um, yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. You know, what is the Bitcoin community? Is it maybe a Bitcoin art space? Is it just a creative community? Is it something we can even define? And, and should we? I think it's really fascinating. I noticed it first with my own personal journey and Bitcoin and realize that it's very similar to the journeys of, uh, of many Bitcoiners. Uh, you know, when you start looking into Bitcoin, there's kind of a natural path, right? Like it starts with skepticism. And then at some point the flip switches for you, you go down the rabbit hole, you invest a little bit of money, you start learning more about it. You invest a little bit more money probably. <laughs> and uh, before long, for most people, it kind of consumes your attention. It did for me, and I know it does for many. Uh, and you know, it, it's really interesting to think what about Bitcoin like sucks people in 
uh, Max Kaiser calls it like the metaphysical properties of Bitcoin. Something, it could be something about just absolute scarcity or, you know, the, the absolute truth of the Bitcoin network. Uh, and sometimes I even think about it more recently, I've been thinking about it as like, Bitcoin is like the hero's journey of money. And it, like, we're, we're fascinated by stories and, and all of these stories, they follow a similar arc where it's like, you know, a hero starts from humble beginnings, goes through trials and tribulations and ultimately prevail, prevails. I feel like we're witnessing that with Bitcoin and just watching that story unfold in the real world, people can't help but to watch and root for Bitcoin once they get into it. But whatever it is, uh, it just sucks people in. And you know, whether you are a, a technical person someone who focuses on content, a narrator like yourself, or, you know, more drawn to the arts, there is a way for everybody to contribute to this space. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I think the infrastructure for the technologist is pretty clear. Like there's plenty of opportunities to create software using Bitcoin, especially now that the protocol is more mature and the infrastructure layer is more developed. Uh, people like us who are more fo more focused on apps, we can build on top of BTC Pay Server. We can build on top of the Lightning Network to create new consumer-facing experiences uh, for narration. I think we're just starting to see the new possibilities that Bitcoin and specifically the Lightning Network unlocks. Uh, whether it's you know breaking the the paywall model and and paying for content on an individual basis or you know paying to stream a podcast like the sphinx chat is is starting up now um i think there's a world of possibility that that we're going to see unfold within the next couple of years and in the art space look i mean the true og bitcoin artists have been creating bitcoin art you know for many many years and they've been doing it just out of kind of pure passion without real effective means for for selling their work you know of course twitter in its own way acts as a marketplace and there is you know uh, bitcoin talk the forums there have been amazing at uh at creating auctions and ways to sell bitcoin art and collectibles through kind of a one a web 1.0 forum mm -hmm. uh, but we think there's a real opportunity to create an open marketplace that makes it as easy as possible for artists to connect with all potential Bitcoin collectors around the world. And by creating this marketplace, we think we, we can support uh, this part of the Bitcoin space really grow. You know, it's like, in a way, there hasn't really been a market for this yet. And we're hoping to, to help create that market. And if we do, uh, we hope to incentivize artists. I'm sure there are many creatives in the Bitcoin space who you know, they have an idea for an art project, but they just haven't done it because they didn't feel like they had a way to make money from it. Uh, and we are hoping to create that option for them. Uh, and it, you know, it, it goes so far. I think, I think um, we tend to think of Bitcoin as a financial revolution, which absolutely it is, but it's just as much of a cultural revolution. You know, Bitcoin stands for something. It's a way of life for many people. It's changed many people's lives. Mm -hmm. And people are so enthusiastic about it once they get into it. And they want to express their enthusiasm for Bitcoin. And whether it's through art, clothing, you know, collectibles, we want to be the marketplace that helps people uh, find you know, the goods that kind of represent their Bitcoin enthusiasm. Awesome. So it sounds like beyond auctions, you're looking at making it a, a wider marketplace uh, where people can find all sorts of goods. Is that, is that right? We are. Uh, we are focused on uh, supporting Bitcoin culture and adoption. Mm -hmm. So uh, at least for the foreseeable future, anything that we sell will have you know, a, a Bitcoin bent to it. But again, like Bitcoin, to me, Bitcoin culture is not it doesn't have to have a Bitcoin logo on it, right? Like to me, Bitcoin symbolizes freedom, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, you know, uh, just striving for a, a, a better lifestyle. Uh, so I think that kind of, it, it extends in, in, in a broad spectrum. Um, but yeah, beyond original art through auctions, 
we have tested limited edition sales like clothing, like the face masks that I mentioned. We think there's a lot more that we can do with that. Uh, so what we are planning in, in the pretty near term is bundling limited edition sales with our auctions. So what this would look like is, you know, if let's just say, let's use Chief Monkey as an example. If he were doing another auction, uh, look that his original artwork went for one Bitcoin. Not everybody can participate in that auction. So maybe there's t-shirts uh, with his designs that are also available or prints of the original artwork that are also available. Maybe there's also sticker packs. Uh, so the idea here is anybody who wants, who's like into Chief Monkey's artwork and who Chief Monkey is as a Bitcoin artist, they have a way to participate and get a piece of that sale. Uh, no matter what, you know, what their preferences are, are or what their, you know, their limitations are as, as far as, you know, spending money. That's cool. It's a good idea because I think people, um, I think that there's a lot of people that think, you know, now that Bitcoin's, you know, $40,000 and, you know, trending upward, uh, oh, I've missed it. But people don't realize that you can buy, you know, fractions of Bitcoin, uh, known as sats or bits, depending where you, you stand on the, the issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's just testament towards how early we are in this space. You know, we got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, certainly, and, and again, Lightning Network helps us. Like, we can make micro payments on, on Lightning. Um, so you wanted to talk a little bit about NFTs. And now NFTs are typically, uh, it's usually seen as an Ethereum only product, but I want to get your thoughts on that because it sounds like that's not the case. In my opinion, uh, it doesn't have to be the case. And uh, yeah, I, I like anytime a podcaster asks me what I want to talk about, I always throw out NFTs because I feel like it's the most controversial opinion I have. And if we're going to sit here and talk for an hour, I might as well stir the pot a little bit. Uh, <laughs> It's interesting when NFTs hit the Bitcoin zeitgeist every once in a while. You see the flame wars going back and forth, and it's usually like the Ethereum people versus the Bitcoin people. And the, the consensus on the Bitcoin side is that NFTs are just like this silly hype toy. Uh, and while there's certainly a lot of hype, and you know, I I could agree that at times, you know, the current format of NFTs gets uh, saturated and, and bubbly. Uh, I think NFTs as a general concept are here to stay. And not only that, I think they're extremely important. I've come to believe that NFTs are uh, the infrastructure for what I see as kind of like the next phase of the internet. And, you know, I'm specifically referring to the metaverse. Now, totally nebulous concept. No one really knows what this is going to look like. It's, you know, something we read about in sci-fi books. Uh, but we're already seeing like the, the, the early beginnings of what an, a metaverse could be. You know, Fortnite, Minecraft, Roblox could be considered centralized versions of a metaverse. Uh, and in the Ethereum space, you have projects like Decentraland, uh, Crypto Voxels, and others that are showing what a more decentralized metaverse could look like. So, you know, it's unclear what the final version of this is going to be. My guess is it's going to be a hybrid of these different worlds with these different trade-offs and ways to um, seamlessly move from one to the other. Uh, but what I think is going to be really important with the final version of a decentralized metaverse is that there will be ownership of the digital goods in that metaverse uh, and there will be open marketplaces for those digital goods and that's essentially what nfts make possible uh, so while it's easy to look at crypto kitties and say okay i could just copy paste this thing and experience it in the same way that the owner could uh, in the metaverse you know i, I don't think that's going to be the case and what we're already seeing is that first of all, there's real demand from buyers to collect these NFTs. Uh, and that is incentivizing artists to create new types of NFTs uh, that use digital art uh, to create more immersive artistic experiences that just aren't possible in the physical world. Mm 
-hmm. And there's also, because this is, you know, software, it's digital, there's so much more functionality you can add on top of NFT art that you, that's just not possible with physical art. Uh, you know, you can add commercial rights uh, to an NFT, you can represent a legal contract of some sort. Uh, you can tether the uh, experience of the, of the NFT, the, the aesthetics of the NFT to real world, real world events. There's um, uh, one NFT that's out there that it changes its appearance based on Bitcoin's price. Uh, so a world of possibilities there. And I think we're just scratching the surface of what's really possible with these things. And because there already is this kind of growing marketplace of buyers and sellers of NFTs, you're seeing the infrastructure level develop. And whether it's these virtual worlds or you know, other ways to interact with NFTs, there's gonna be new ways to experience NFTs that you own uh, that you, know, you can't just copy and paste and experience in the same way if you're not the owner of the NFTs. Um, so I'm a big believer in the space. I think it does have a long way to go. I think it's gonna take five to 10 years to figure out what this technology is really capable of. Uh, but uh, with the assumption that it is important, I think it's also important to bring NFTs back to Bitcoin. You know, the metaverse, if this does end up being a social layer of the internet where we spend a significant amount of our time uh, and invest a significant amount of our assets in, uh, you know, look at, the kids playing Fortnite these days, spending thousands of dollars on, on skins, like they're not going to, they're not going back from that, right? Like they're going to continue investing a large chunk of their money in digital goods, especially when there's a way to do it in a more trustless way that doesn't depend on Fortnite, right? Uh, so the, the infrastructure of the NFTs and these virtual worlds, uh, we're going to want them on a really secure foundation. And, uh, Ethereum, look, I love a lot of the applications being built on top of it, but I have real concerns with the fundamentals of Ethereum. Like we don't know what proof of stake is really going to look like. Uh, ETH 2.0, we've been promised that for years. Uh, so like, I don't want to own, like I don't want my virtual assets uh, with the expectation that it's going to be a significant amount a significant percentage of my assets. I don't want that on Ethereum. I don't feel good about that. I'd feel much better if it if they had Bitcoin at their foundation. And I think this is going to be more important over time. Uh, so this is the option we want to create in the space. Uh, you know, we're first focused on physical art, but RGB is a third layer protocol that's going to uh, create a new model for Bitcoin NFTs. We want to be pioneers implementing that um, that protocol. And um, look, we're supporting Bitcoin culture and adoption now, but we see this as an entryway to ultimately becoming a marketplace for uh, Bitcoin NFTs for a Bitcoin-based metaverse. That's really cool. I like it. I could see a lot of uh, potential VR applications as this industry matures. You having unique tokens, um, and just for, for listeners that aren't familiar with NFTs, those are non-fungible tokens. Um, where would you recommend if people were looking to read up a little bit more on them, uh, they, they could go? Boy, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, I mean, look, it, the application layer on Ethereum NFTs is, um, it's, it's exploding. There's no, data, no doubt about it. Uh, so, you know, the, the Ethereum marketplaces are probably the best way to get educated in what this is about, you know, whether it's super rare or nifty gateway or, you know, just type in, <laughs> just type in NFTs and you're going to see the latest headlines of uh, Beeple or Trevor Jones selling their NFTs for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, so if, if you start looking, it's pretty easy to find information on it. But look, at, at their fundamental core, what they really are, are um, they're tokens that are associated with some type of media, you know, whether that's an image, a, a GIF, GIF, whatever, or a video. Uh, and, you know, I think we're not going to be limited to those media formats going forward. Um, and they, they uh, use the cryptography of whatever blockchain to prove the creator of that token. 
am the owner of that token. And uh, through the blockchain, you can, uh, you can see the full provenance of ownership of that token. And when you have these ownership models, you combine that with open marketplaces and it becomes really easy all of a sudden to transact these, uh, these NFTs, these non-fungible tokens for the, uh, you know, the cryptocurrency of your choice. And uh, it, it creates an amazing dy dynamic. Like I like to think about you know, the traditional Renaissance and being an artist during that time, even an extremely um, you know, well-recognized artist, uh, the Mona Lisa was, uh, you know, that was commissioned work. That was uh, a Venice merchant paying Leonardo da Vinci to paint uh, his daughter, I believe. Uh, so, you know, while Leonardo da Vinci certainly put his heart and soul into the artistic creativity of that work, it wasn't I his idea. It's not like he was burning with desire to create the Mona Lisa. And when you have these open marketplaces that these token models enable, now, even in this early form, uh, you know, there are probably a thousand artists around the world that are making a living off of being an artist with digital art. Uh, they're, and they're creating art that they truly want to create. Uh, and all they have to do is find one buyer anywhere around the world that identifies with that work of art and values it and is willing to pay for it. Uh, so I think that's, look, that's a, that's a beautiful thing for artists and, and what's good for artists is great for society. And, you know, we're just in the early beginnings of this. Um, so we think it's a, a huge opportunity to bring NFTs back to Bitcoin where we feel like they can have a stronger foundation and uh, hopefully have a better opportunity to scale into you know, the massive liquidity of, of Bitcoin holders around the world. Nice. It'd be cool to see and explore the additional media, you know, like experience, uh, a tokenized experience that you could, you could trade between people or memes and things like that. You know, I love that you down. say memes. <laughs> I love that you say memes. And this is, again, I, I love giving Chief Monkey credit for things, but he's, he's always has the best ideas. But um, yeah, like you, you think about Bitcoin Twitter, like the Bitcoin space in general, Bitcoin has the best memes, hands down. Like you, mm -hmm. can't, you can't even argue with that if you're familiar with them. Uh, so what does it look like if you tokenize these memes? Uh, I know there's a lot of people out there who would love to have ownership digital ownership of these memes. I think they could be considered quite valuable, some of them, especially the ones that have aged to be really iconic. And it creates, again, a dynamic where people are more incentivized to create memes. Like today, it's, it's just amazing that people are creating these memes just, like, <laughs> you know, just to be able to share them with people and get some attention around them. Imagine if they could actually make money from it. Imagine the, uh, the rocket fuel we could add to the already amazing Bitcoin meme space. Yeah, it'd be really cool to see. And, you know, like people have put a lot of work into it. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, I really like the idea of this whole new marketplace opening where people can be rewarded for past work. Because a lot of people just do things because they're passionate. And I think at its purest, you know, that's, that's creation. And that's, um, I think when you start trying to monetize that uh, in, a, in an inauthentic way, that's when you start getting, you know, like the, like the corporate, uh, what are they? You, you go into any office and you've got like, you know, patients or <laughs> like leadership and it's like a pretty painting and it's just really flat and there's nothing yeah. to it. Yeah. No HR in Bitcoin. HR is not allowed <laughs> in Bitcoin. Uh, no, you, you bring up a really good point. Um, and I think we're seeing this, frankly, in, in the Ethereum space already where, uh, you know, talent has started to become commoditized like there's so much talent out there and some of these artists are just cranking out piece after piece on a daily basis even the creativity feels like it's been uh somewhat commoditized uh but i i think i think the way we're going to look at this space you know down the road and i think you i think the same can be said for the different periods of art in the past and i'm no like art history uh you know scholar or anything but like you know the physical art and the contemporary period uh, of art 
you know, there's, there's Banksy and there's like Jeff Koons uh, are just two examples of people. And, you know, Jeff Koons, like he has a, he has a factory of people working for him to create his artwork. Uh, I don't think history is going to look great on that. You know, while Banksy, he, you know, his work just screams authenticity. It all has a strong social message that's super relevant to today's society. And he does work. Uh, he continues to do work that is not for profit uh, while he still makes, I'm sure, a great living off of his artwork. So I think it's the authenticity which is really going to stand the test of time in this space. And again, I think that's another advantage uh, that Bitcoin NFTs and Bitcoin art in general can offer. We are focused on Bitcoin artists. And, you know, there's obvious that there's subjective definitions for what that is. Mm -hmm. uh, but look, I love the idea of like, I'm not, I would, don't tie me to this, but like people who are artists that sell on, on scarce city, like I want to know that they're Bitcoin artists and, you know, maybe they can sign a message with their private key showing that they have ownership of Bitcoin, or maybe they can, uh, open a lightning channel with us just to prove that they're real Bitcoiners, uh, in the Ethereum space, you see some of these artists and, you know, I hear them do interviews and, I, and they say they just like were introduced to the blockchain space a month ago <laughs> and they're already creating art that has a Bitcoin logo on it. Like, what is that about? You know, like, mm -hmm. so um, look, I think authenticity, the uh, it's, 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 it's more than the artwork. It's so much about the artist. And I think, uh, you know, the authenticity and the motives of the artist, that's going to stand the test of time. And those are the artworks that are going to be considered most valuable in the future as we kind of mature along this, what I see as a Bitcoin revolution. Mm -hmm. Well, what's interesting about art is usually you see the most expressive art um, that... Uh, I guess it's pure in its form when people go through conflict, uh, whether that's, you know, they're in a war-torn nation, it just people kind of turn inward and they don't really know where to put that creative spirit. And so they, you know, conduct it into something that is expressive. Um, and I think, you know, as we see societies more shift toward, you know, they're more stable. Again, you start getting that kind of HR art. Um, I know in the countries that I've traveled to, you know, some of the most amazing artists come from the, the poorest places. So I really love the idea of, you know, people that are struggling right now, maybe they can, you know, they're creating something and they just, they don't have any other avenue other than their art to, to put that kind of, you know, that angst. Um, so I love the fact that, you know, they might be going through tough times now, but maybe they can, you know, benefit from that in the future. And I think that, um, yeah, I really applaud you on creating that environment and marketplace for them so that, you know, today's future struggling and starving artists will maybe one day be able to not be in that state. For sure. You know, a lot of these artists, they, they just bleed Bitcoin and they want to express their passion for Bitcoin and art is their outlet to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so like, you know, there, while there's always the risk of over commercializing a space, some of these artists, they're not able to, to focus as much attention on Bitcoin as they would be able to if they could make a career out of it. You know, maybe they have, maybe they're working 40 to 70, 80 hours a week doing something that they just have to sustain their lives with and can only devote a small percentage of their attention towards Bitcoin art. If all of a sudden they can just focus on Bitcoin art, uh, they can create more Bitcoin art and, and it's, it can still maintain its authenticity as long as their passion for Bitcoin is authentic. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And if you look at um, art, you know, going back through history, usually it was the the artists that were able to, um, you know, have a patron be able to support their work so they could focus exclusively on that. So I often wonder how many uh, more interesting creative works we would have if people had the ability to, you know, to be able to take the time out of their lives to be able to explore that. It's it's either you're kind of either in survival mode or you're in this unique creative space. And there's not really many avenues between the two. Well, I think we're going to find out. I think, uh, <laughs> look, I think uh, I see it focusing around Bitcoin. But in general, these open marketplaces with token economics, it's going to enable, it's it's creating an entire like primordial soup for um for new artistic uh, channels and 
new ways to make money from that. And that's just going to create more art over time. And I think it's going to be beautiful for the creative space in general. Yeah, it'd be nice to see, you know, people think um, the digital world, they think just like, you know, it's, it's ones and zeros and it's very like formulaic, but um, I'm loving this new creative kind of rebirth that we're seeing in this space. And I'm curious to see where it goes over the next decade or two. Yeah, it's, uh, I always think about um, Mark, Mark Andreessen's quote that software is eating the world and we've seen it through the different phases of in the internet, right? Where it's like, you know, specifically with media, right? Like digital content enabled by software totally dwarfs physical content now. And I think we're going to see the same thing with each industry over time. And I think it's now's the now's we're coming upon the time for art uh, to experience that. And, um, you know, beyond that, even, you know, digital goods compared to physical goods. Like I wouldn't be surprised if uh, 10 years from now, there's you know, more money spent on, <laughs> this sounds crazy, but I believe it, digital, uh, digital clothing than physical clothing. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, this is, it starts with art, but you can apply it to any type of asset or good. Uh, it, I even think about like real estate, right? Like real estate has become so unattainable for so much of the world. You're going to have digital, digital real estate. You already do have digital real estate and that is going to be attainable for uh, everybody in the world in a different, in a different form. So, uh, you know, software eating the world, I think we're going to see that applied to the, you know, the the different application of, of goods, whether it's art, clothing, real estate, and just assets in general, it's going to be fascinating to watch. I'm really curious. So you're, you're familiar with the concept of citadels? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so for listeners and viewers that aren't, um, it's the idea that you've got this kind of um, stronghold and whether that's an actual physical place or whether that's a, an idealistic place, uh, it'd be really interesting to see um, how digital citadels um, start and... I don't know, kind of like you've got like the exclusive message board, the, you know, if you only go through a certain of tests you can get into um, and whatever. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see what that's going to look like. Yeah, I agree. Like, I think anytime we have a new technology, the first impulse is to take the physical version of it and try to digitize it. When it usually turns out like that, the purely digital form is what becomes really important, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, going back to content, uh, just throwing a, a physical newspaper on the internet was, or, you know, physical magazine on the internet was kind of one of the first applications, but it turns out that like podcasts or, you know, blogs or, you know, tweets have become much more important to digital content. And I think we're going to see the same thing happen in the NFT space throughout all of its applications. So if you're, uh, I guess, for newer artists looking to contribute, um, how would they reach out to you? How can they get involved? I'm really easy to find uh, on Twitter, at scarce.dot uh, city. DMs are open. You can always also reach out to me on my personal Twitter account. That's at C, last name, Tremont. Uh, you can also sign up for our newsletter and stay up to date and get our email there. Reach out to me whichever way you're most comfortable with. We are always interested in talking with anybody who's passionate about uh, Bitcoin art and the creative space in Bitcoin. Uh, but we're specifically looking for uh, Bitcoin artists. We do have kind of a founding group of Bitcoin artists that have been involved from the very beginning. And we are limiting our sales uh, to their works right now because frankly, we have a lot of kinks to work out in our processes. We're dealing with you know, sending physical items across the world. Um, there's, there's a lot of, it's not as simple as just throwing up an auction and asking people to bid on it. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to minimize the risk for buyers and sellers. Uh, and, you know, something that's important to us also is trying to um, prove the authenticity of the work. So we have certificates of authenticity that we offer for all artwork that we're selling that uses the Bitcoin blockchain to prove uh, the true artist and prove ownership of the buyer uh, and prove the, the value for each transaction. So a lot of this, uh, you know, it's going to take some time to operationalize and get ready for a larger audience. Uh, but in the meantime, 
we love connecting with artists. We love seeing what they're working on. And uh, we hope to onboard them as soon as possible. Awesome. And if people are just looking to help, how can they get involved? Again, DM me, email me, um, you know, anybody who's passionate about the space, even if you don't know how to contribute, hit me up. I love to chat about these things. So, you know, we're always, at some point, we'll be looking for more developers. Uh, we'll be looking for investors at some point. Um, so any way that uh, you want to contribute, there's, uh, we may be able to find a place for you. So happy to, happy to explore it. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate your time today. Um, I like to often close out some of the shows is asking if you have a, a question for viewers and listeners. Um, so over to you. Do I have a question for uh, viewers and listeners? Oh, look, I mean, the NFT space is one of the most misunderstood spaces. So it's, it's less of a question. It's more of a call to action to check this out. You know, try to explore its possibilities you should be skeptical at the beginning. I certainly was, uh, but see the art that's be being created and see how it's, it's being experienced. Uh, I, I think the sooner that um, you understand its capabilities, the, the better you are going to be, better prepared you're going to be to maybe contribute to it or uh, embrace it. Um, and, you know, help us bring it to Bitcoin. I think it's, uh, I think it's you know, not just important for us, I think it's important for the entire ecosystem to have a solid foundation for what I think is this really important technology. So start talking about it. Uh, let's get you know, all of the, uh, the technologists in Bitcoin uh, hopefully thinking about this in a more serious way. Awesome. All right, thanks again.